Okay. I have way too many slides and not enough time to cover them all, so let's go. Um, so impact craters. Ceres has way more impact craters than we expected. So as uh, people have talked already, we expected this very, very ice-rich crust that would lead us to think that there'd be all these viscously relaxed craters. And in fact, we found some very crisp, clear craters. And um, a number of them actually had fractures on the floor. And hopefully, I blew this up to enough point where you can actually see these fractures in this image. Um, so these craters that we observed on Ceres are morphologically very similar to a class of lunar crater called floor fractured craters. It's such an original name. And there's six different classes of these craters, with some of these classes having subclasses. Um, and if I had time, I'd go through what the difference is between all of these. But I'm going to focus on class ones with radial and concentric fractures and central peak complexes. We've got an example of a class one right here. And then class fours, which have these shallow V-profile moats between the wall and the crater interior. So these have a formation model of magmatism beneath the crater forming the fractures. The idea being that there is floor uplift due to magmatic intrusion below the crater. An alternate hypothesis was floor shallowing due to viscous relaxation. But uh, a study showed that only magmatic intrusion could explain the V-shaped moats that were observed in some of the classes of these features. So currently, the magmatic model is the preferred model. So as is typical, when we see features on one body that is similar to, morphologically similar to a, a feature on another body, we suspect that it might have the similar formation mechanism. Um, so we look into this magmatic model for formation um, of four fractured craters on the moon. And the idea is that a dike propagates towards the surface beneath this crater, encounters this highly fractured, low-density region beneath the crater, and stalls out. But there's still driving pressure from beneath. So you start getting a sill propagating laterally. But when the sill hits the crater rims, the increased overburden pressure makes the sill stall. So first we have a dike stall, and now we have a sill stalling. But there's still driving pressure from beneath. And so we get some lacolith formation and doming of the crater floor. And a mathematical evaluation of these showed that once you reach a certain critical value, uh, the sill will actually tabularly deform. Instead of just bending, it will actually completely pop up, as you see in this particular image right here, um, with localized bending structures here at the periphery of the intrusion. <clears throat> so just showing uh, closer up of one of these class one floor fractured craters, these have these concentric fractures at where the crater floor and the crater wall meet. And this is where that tabular deformation would start fracturing. But then there's also concentric and radial fractures in the center due to that bending, that lacolith type bending of the crater floor. So these fracture systems are very similar to what I've uh, classified as class one floor fracture craters on series. We have eight of these. This is Akator Crater, which we've already seen. And here's a fracture map, just so you can see what you might not be able to see in the image. And then there's also Dantu, which has another very extensive fracture system. I'm just going to kind of blow through these, but Akator and Dantu are kind of the type uh, class one fractures, or floor fracture craters on series, because they have this complete set of the concentric and the radial fractures, um, which suggests if this was formed by magmatism, we'd have this completely mature magmatic model, as was proposed for the moon. But there are other craters. Ekapati just has a few fractures, or Azaka, where we only have fractures going linearly across the floor or Zeno, where we have this very interesting sort of, I don't know, radial pattern, but only half radial. <laughs> um, Gao, which just has some random fractures. And then Kupalu, which has that concentric fracturing, but not all the way around the floor. And Hulani, which only has concentric fractures in a very small, limited part of the floor. So perhaps these are also formed by the magmat you know, magmatism from beneath, but not both types of different kinds of magmatism. We might have just doming of the crater center in Izaku and Zenu and Gao and Ekapati, but perhaps just um, the tabular deformation for Kapalo and Holani, where you see those concentric fractures. The other type of floor fracture crater we observe on series are class four floor fracture craters. These do not have the clear, crisp fracturing. If you looked at this, you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, that's fractured. Um, but class four fractures are typified by a shallow V-shaped profile. And here is a topographic profile across Lokio Crater, which you're seeing here. This profile is going from here to here. And you can see there's this V-shaped profile. 
and a moat on the outside with some doming and an inner ridge. This is typical of a type V or 4B uh, class 4 crater on the moon. Um, there's also A, where the interior has this kind of convex floor and more of fractures that are more similar to what you would see in a class 1. We don't actually see any of those on series. And then class 4C, which has the V-shaped moat and then just a very hummocky interior. Lokio has these kind of subtle fractures. Um, they're not really crisp, but they are fractures. So there are other class 4 fractures. These are mostly the hummocky material. <coughs> Excuse me. But they all have the V-shaped moat. Uh, one other thing that's interesting about these floor fracture craters uh, on the moon and on Ceres is that they have floors that are consistently shallow compared to the average crater on that, their body. So uh, this right here is a value of depth versus diameter for the average Ceres crater that was um, deduced by Paul Schenck um, coming, you know, like by measuring every single crater on Ceres and coming up with what the average crater was. All of these floor fracture craters, the ones in red are the class 1, the ones in black are the class 4, are sh more shallow than this average number. I have, just to be make sure I was doing this correctly, I determined the depths using my, my method for determining depth of other craters. And most of them would be up here if they weren't fractured. Or sometimes I actually had some right on the line, which I thought was interesting. But um, the shallow ones were all these floor fractured craters. And it is interesting to note, I think, that we have a different slope for the class 1s and the class 4s, which is consistent with the magmatic model, where the uh, fracture craters should be more shallow than hummocky craters for their size, because there's increased uh, uplift on those. That's what causes the increased fracturing. Just as an aside, Mike just talked about the domes. These red features <coughs> are the domes as mapped by Hannah Sizemore. This one is, wait. This one is no longer on her map. I just haven't had a chance to remove it yet. I thought this was interesting because um, if, if these domes are, in fact, viscously, viscously relaxed volcanic structures and the floor fracture craters are magmatic structures, I thought it was kind of interesting that we never see one of these domes in a floor fracture crater. And none of the domes are in, while many of them are in craters, none of them are in craters that have fractures. And you can kind of see there's it's almost a counter correlation, which perhaps suggests that there are features over time in the series crust that led some fractures to actually form volcanic structures while others fractured from beneath. Um, so we've had a lot of discussion already this morning, even though we're still pretty early into the workshop, about how probable is cryomagmatism in the first place? How, how likely is this to happen? So <clears throat> an analysis of the surface of series using our VIR instrument um, has revealed widespread presence of magnesium serpentine, ammoniated smectite clays, and calcium magnesium carbonates. So uh, various members of our team, Julie and Christina, uh, use these observations to make assumptions as to the evolution of an early ocean in series and found that upon freezing, we get various salt species and um, residual brines. And this is supported by gravity and topography studies that there could have been, uh, that there could still be brines in the interior of Ceres, though mixed with silicates to kind of make a high viscosity mud. So instead of an ocean world, we have a mud world. Um, so in our study, we assumed that these brines, this muddy brine, is the source of the cryomagma that might have formed the Syrian uh, floor fracture craters. <coughs> so I'm citing Pollard and Johnson, but I want to tell you how much I followed the work of Lauren Joswiak, who's sitting right there, um, for this study. So I, I very much took what she was doing for the lunar floor fracture craters and just used that to see what the driving pressures would be required on Ceres to form some of these structures. So using the Pollard and Johnson equation, we would need to know things like the density difference between the host rock and the magma, fracture toughness, distance the magma has to travel, and acceleration due to gravity to figure out what kind of driving pressure we would need to actually be able to have a volcanic eruption on the surface. And it was kind of interesting trying to come up with the variables for this um, because I, I had to go to some really obscure <laughs> places to try and find things like fracture toughness and Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio for the type of materials we we're seeing on series. But using fracture, uh, these various variables 
and applying them to features that we knew for series, uh, like density of series crust and the thickness of the crust. Uh, we were able to determine that uh, a magma under Akator crater, using Akator as an example, would only need 1.7 megapascals to erupt on the surface. This is not super high. It's actually consistent with what uh, Lene, oops, Lene Quick predicted uh, in her later talk. She'll be talking about her work. Um, it's significantly less than what's needed for the moon. And it's even an order of magnitude less than what's needed for Europa. It's a very small value. <clears throat> The magmatic model also invokes both bending stresses due to doming and this tabular uplift, block uplift. And Weichmann and Schultz determined the deriving pressures needed for both of these. Uh, if the growth of the lacolith is modeled as the flexure of a layered sequence of elastic plates, you get this uh, equation to describe the driving pressure needed. Um, and then if we're looking at block uplift, this is the equation to describe the block uplift, where K is magma yield strength. And this is the magma weight. Um, so following Joswiak et al., we did our thickness of the intrusion beneath the floor fracture crater as the actual depth or of the crater versus how deep it should be using that perfect depth versus diameter crater um, analysis that Paul did. So um, for this, for these values, we can determine the driving pressure <coughs> created necessary to create block uplift. And on Akator, that would only be 0.33 to 0.38 megapascals, even lower than what you would need to erupt on the surface. So we do not need crazy driving pressures. However, we do need driving pressure. So as we've been talking, you know, people have already mentioned this, how active could the interior of series be? Would there be some kind of uplift? Would there be driving pressure that could possibly form these features? So like Michael did, I'm going to talk a little bit about the solid state flow model, uh, which is exemplified by salt tectonics on Earth. Um, and salt tectonics on Earth are primarily driven by differential loading. So buoyancy does play a part, but what really plays a part is what's over it. How, you know, over here it's really, really thick, and over here it's really, really thin. And so the salt flows this way, where there's less material above it. Um, so the model for series suggests that differential loading is brought about by the sudden removal of material due to impact cratering. If you had, um, in Julie's presentation, she mentioned that in the, the version of the series crust that invokes, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the word. You, you wouldn't expect straight layering in the series crust. So if we had like little blebs of ice-rich material just kind of sitting there in the crust, when an impact hit near that area, you could actually get removal of the surface material, suddenly creating a differential loading environment, which would create flow of the low viscosity, low density material into the crater. Uh, Michael had a much better image of this. It would kind of bulge out here at the crater wall. And this is kind of the area where in several of our floor fractured craters, we have extensive fracturing. So Dantu and Akator both have foci of fracturing in just this like little area. So if this was an area where one of these bulges were coming through, that could have caused all of this fracturing through the solid state flow bulge into the crater as opposed to cryomagmatism beneath the surface. Uh, Kapalo as well, just because it's not 360 de degrees around the crater like you would expect if the entire floor was being lifted up. <clears throat> so we have done a study that suggests very little driving pressure is required to create Floor fracture craters on series due to cryomagmatism. New models of solid state flow indicate that material would bulge into the wall of any crater that formed at the edge of one of these layers of low viscosity, low density material. And some of the fractures are, in fact, consistent with formation due to this model. But there are floor fracture crater fractures that are not consistent with solid state flow. And um, Julie showed that beautiful picture of Dantu Crater where there were um, sodium carbonate deposits associated with the fractures. We've also seen these from the very beginning in Akator, where they're very t closely correlated to fracturing. Um, and that is actually more consistent with the idea that these are formed by cryomagnetism. Like Michael, my takeaway is we might actually be seeing both processes at work, but we need to keep studying both of them before we know what's going on here for real. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Are there questions for Deborah? Questions?
I have 36 slides. <laughs> so I have a short question. So if you assume a heterogeneous distribution where you have more ice on one side of the other than on the other side, and then that, that introduces the flow, but wouldn't the region that has more ice also be more susceptible to melting due to the impact? So, could, you know, it's not so clear to me that it has to be just solid flow, but you could have preferential melting on that side. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if that was, I'm so sorry, <coughs> part of what's going on. Um, there has been some impact modeling done uh, by Tim Bowling, I believe his paper is in review, um, where he has shown impact cratering and melting due to impact cratering and how long would some kind of melt body last due to that and could we get cryovolcanism due to that. And that is, uh, it's looking possible. It does f freeze, I think, faster than we would need it to, but it's still something that needs to be taken into account when we look at these. So, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, we have time. Thanks. Uh, that's a very nice modeling. And have you considered applying it to Hounamans, for example, on the diking and sea intrusion? I never, no, I didn't apply it to Hounamans. Um, <coughs> um, no, just the floor fractured craters themselves, because so if a Hunamans is in fact an extrusive lava flow, then we'd have to go back to the original value where we, you needed the 1.7 megapascals, uh, which is still not a lot of driving yeah. pressure. So, um, but I know that there's other issues like bringing the temperatures high enough, like you talked about in yours. Mm -hmm. 